Greetings and salutations and welcome to video number three in our series called Linux Terminal Basics. In this series we're taking a look at some tools and concepts that will help you to become better at administrating Linux systems whether it be your home desktop or a bunch of servers in the cloud we are assuming that you already know a little bit about the terminal that you can navigate maybe you've run some commands maybe you've even edited some files thus far in video one we have looked at text in video two we looked at working with files and this time around we're going to talk about executable programs and paths and we're going to talk about storage and we'll take a little bit of a look at how to keep an eye on what's going on in your system we're going to look at gathering information and system monitoring so we've got a lot to cover but before we get into that I want to say thank you very much for all the kind encouraging comments that video number one and video number two have already gotten a lot of folks had nice things to say and even added useful information to the conversation so thank you very much so the first thing that we're going to talk about is executable paths what is that well it is where the system looks to find all of the programs that are installed on the system and if you want to know what your path statement is just type in echo dollar sign and then the capital word path all in caps that will read the variable that's stored in the shell environment that contains this information. What is a variable? Well, it's just a chunk of information that you want to have sitting in memory. When you log into your system, a lot of these variables are generated by the system and programs that run in the shell or even on your desktop can draw from these variables and get all kinds of information about the computer that they're running on and information about you as a user so if you want to see all of that just type in the environment command and you'll see a big long list of them here I mean some of the stuff it's pretty straightforward like uh, let's see here we've got user well that's Joe and then up there there's username that's Joe as well so somewhere in here is your path statement and that's what we're going to be talking about in particular today all of this is generated by the system as it boots up. There are configuration files in the slash etc directory and in your home directory where uh, this is all kept. And so what we're going to concentrate mainly on is just uh, we're going to concentrate on your local bin and we're going to talk about one location where programs are stored called USR slash local bin and these are important because this is where you would put programs if you created them yourselves we're talking about scripts we're talking about any code that you would compile and we're talking about uh, just anything that you're working on that's yours for that moment so I have created in my home directory a directory called bin and in Ubuntu and in many other systems, Debian as well, if you do that, when you reboot the system, when you log back in, it goes, oh, you have a bin directory in your user folder. Let me add that to your path and let me make that the very first place that I look for programs. That way you can have a program that you're working on that is actually installed somewhere else in the system and they both have the same name. And instead of you having to have a different name, you can have the same name and the system will look in your local bin directory first and it won't pay any attention to anything else later on in the path statement that you see up there. So what are all of those different directories? Well, that's where the package management system on your system, on your Linux computer, puts different applications. We don't throw them all in one basket. We put them in special directories that kind of signify what they do so if you see sbin for instance that's going to be something for the system administrator to use not necessarily every user on the system anything that goes in the usr directory in under bin or local bin that would be something that's available to everyone anything that goes into your local bin directory that you created yourself that's just yours and nobody else can use it so let's put that into action and see how it works so you'll notice here that I have 
a script already in here called hello sh it's the same one that we were working on in the last video remember we just changed the permissions on it to get it to run i never actually ran it if i just type in hello first of all if i just type in hello dot sh and i try and run it in my home directory like this it says the command's not found reason why it's not in this path anywhere that you're seeing up top it's not in any of those directories so the system goes I don't know what you're talking about that is a security feature if you were allowed to just execute any type of executable script program whatever that happens to be in your present working directory then somebody could use that against you they could slip in a Trojan horse they could slip in something that looked like LS but it wasn't. So when you go to list storage, instead of running the ls command, what are you running? You're running whatever they want you to. That's bad. So that's why it's done that way. You can, if you want to, go figure out how to add your present working directory to your path statement. It is possible to do. <laughs> I don't recommend it. <laughs> it's not a good idea. <laughs> but uh, most people would not want to do that anyway but it's Linux Linux will let you do whatever you want hey you can delete the entire system if you want to go right ahead knock yourself out have a good time people have done it so how do I run a program that is not in a path stated place in in up there uh, let's say that I'm just writing a script and I just want to make sure it works all you gotta do is tell the system where it is so the first thing that we do is the dot which represents the current directory and then we say in that directory that's what the slash signifies that tells the shell hey I want you to do something with it in the directory or if we use that with the copy or rsync commands or the move commands that's telling the system I want you to put it in this directory that's what that means and then we can type hello and look I can autofill it that time I can use the tab key because the system knows where to look for it so if I can autofill it it's gonna run it there you go hello world it works so if we want to put it somewhere where we can uh, use it elsewhere on the system then what we can do is just uh, let's just move it we're gonna move hello world and we're gonna put it in my local bin like so let's see if the system finds it now yes it found it well here's the thing if it's in my local bin I'm the only person that can actually use it so if I try and do it as root user it probably won't run nope can't find it why because it's in my local bin directory and that's not in the root users path statement which is different from yours because when you log in as root you create an entirely new environment and you change all of those variables and some of them are different from yours the username is different everything's different and the path statement is different as well so if we want to use this program and have it be available to everybody on the system let's say that you have a system and you got five six user accounts on it and you want everybody that can log into the system to be able to get to a program or script that you're running then where would I put it well where we would put it would be user slash local slash bin and we can just do that really quickly with the move command once again so we're going to move bin hello to slash usr slash local slash bin but it's not going to just let me do it. It, it it's going to deny me the ability to do that why because that is not in my home directory I don't directly have permission to do that so we'll just do that as the root user because the root user is the only person that can move files into other parts of the system outside of your home directory the only places that you have absolute access to are the temp directory and your home directory so let's go ahead and do that now that I have put that there if I do sudo hello it'll run and it didn't even prompt me for a password because the sudo timer was still on so you get the idea gang that little hello world script it comes in quite handy for demonstrating stuff and that's pretty much all I'm gonna talk about 
about paths in this video. It's just an introduction. There's a lot more to be said. You can change your path if you want to. It's contained in configuration files uh, all throughout the system. Now, where what I will show you is if you create your own bin directory, sometimes you might run into a situation where the system doesn't automatically add it. You log, a, you log, log out, you log back in, and it's not seeing it. And you're going, well, what's wrong? And that's because every now and again, it doesn't work when it goes to add to the system. And here's how you fix it. So that command is actually in two places. Let's clear the screen. And what we want to do is we're going to read <laughs> with less. <laughs> that read command wouldn't work. That's uh, typing and talking at the same time makes you do stuff like that. So we're going to look at a, uh, a file which exists in your home directory called profile. I almost said program, but it's just a, it's just a configuration file. And we're looking at it with less. And you see that at the bottom here, the first thing it does is, is it looks to see whether you have a file called bash RC. That's what that little chunk of code does right there. And if it's got it, then it reads it into the system. And then it looks to see whether you have a home uh, slash dot local slash bin. And then it'll add that to the path if you've got that. I don't use that. I just use the bin directory. That is stated right there. Once in a while, especially with Debian, I've noticed for some reason or another, Debian will run bash RC and then it will miss this piece of code right here, this part. So what you have to do is, is you have to manually add it to the bash RC. In Ubuntu, uh, if we look at the bash RC file, you'll see that at the bottom it's already added. So I'm just scanning down through here. It either is or it is not. I think it's in here somewhere. But maybe it's just the way the bash RC file works in Ubuntu that it doesn't cause an issue and it does it in some Debian distributions. I guess I don't know because I'm not seeing it here. I don't think it's added. But either way, if you see that it's in profile and then you see that it's not in bash RC, then what you can do is just add it. That's what I do on Debian systems. So I will open up profile and I will go ahead and copy this part right here all of this text so we can copy that and just we'll just copy it and get out and then we can uh, nano like so go all the way to the bottom and then we can paste that in like so. Now we don't need to do that because it works fine for us in Ubuntu, but like I said, in Debian sometimes it doesn't, and so I'm going to go ahead and just get rid of that because we don't actually need to use that. And of course I didn't even need to backspace through all of that. All I got to do is exit without saving changes, which is what I should probably do anyway, right? <laughs> there you go. So the next thing that we want to talk about is working with storage on your system. And by the way, yes, there's a lot more that goes into paths and working with paths and understanding paths. That's just an introduction. You can go off and learn more on your own if you want to. So let's talk about working with storage. In Linux, we don't have ABCs for our hard drives. We don't have drive icons. We have just devices that are mounted somewhere in the system. And the system does this this way because as far as Unix and Linux are concerned, everything is a file. Remember we talked about working with standard in and standard out before and how that really we're just moving data from one place to the next and that's all the system ever does? Well, guess what? It sees all of the drives on your system as nothing more than files. So let's see, where are all of these places mounted to. Well, they're in a directory on the system called dev. So if we do an ls and then we do this, you see there's a whole bunch of stuff listed here that's in the dev directory. These are all devices that are hooked up. 
And if you know what you're looking for, you can kind of know what you're looking at. So here we have TTYs. Well, these are terminals. And believe it or not, we got a bunch of terminals spun up on the system at any given time. And if we look under S, uh, let's see, see the SDs here, right here? This is your hard drive. That's your storage devices. SDA, SD1, SD2. Those are parts of your hard drive. SD stands for SCSI device. And there's a lot of other stuff in here that might look a little weird, like here's one we're going to look at here in a little while. Zero. <laughs> what is zero? What is that in the dev directory? Your keyboard is in here. Everything is in here somewhere. It's mounted into the dev directory, and the system simply sends data to it as if it was sending it to a file. Basically, that's how it works. Basically, that's how it works. It's not exactly how it works. Sometimes it doesn't work that way in modern Linux systems, but it's the concept by which the thing is supposed to be figured out, I guess, if that makes any sense. Did that make any sense? I doubt it. Anyway, we're going to look at uh, LS block right now because that will tell us the storage devices that are in the system and where they are mounted within the system. So remember our SDA in dev? Well, there it is right there. This is our main hard drive on the system. And on this hard drive, I've got three partitions. So why don't you, let's see, get this to highlight the way I want it to. So we go to SDA, like here. There we go. I'm trying to get that to highlight. So this part right here is really what we're interested in. SDA, that's the hard drive. SDA1 is the first partition, SDA2 is the second partition, SDA3 is the third partition. And you notice that they're mounted in different places. SDA1 contains the system, so SDA1 is mounted at the slash, which is the root of the file system. And then the next one we have a partition called VM, and that partition control uh, contains virtual machine images. And then I have my home directory, which is on SDA3, the third partition on the disk. So what is all this stuff up here? Well, the stuff that says loop, these loop file systems here, those are Ubuntu snap packages. So they run within their own little storage container to keep them secure. That's how it works. And then here, down here you see an SRO. Well, what's that? That is the DVD drive in my computer. So if I put a disk in there, it'll pop up as SRO1 or whatever, however that shows up. So that's useful information, but how can we manipulate this and use it to our advantage? Well, we can also gain information about what's mounted in the system just by running a, a command called mount. Now it doesn't give it in the most pretty way, but now we've got more detailed information here. So let's go down here and find uh, where we have uh, our hard drive mounted. A whole bunch of information, let's see. Uh, so we'll just scan down here. It just dumps it out on the screen. All right, here is SDA and SDA3 and you will see that in this line right here it tells us that SDA3 is mounted on home the type is ext4 that's the file system and this part right here are the rules by which it's it's mounted and so it's uh, read readable writable and then we have a couple of options for ext4 uh, and that by the way is listed as default so how does it know where to mount things? What's telling it to do that? Well, in the case of storage devices and hard drives, we'll be looking at a special file called fstab. So let's clear the screen. And we will take a look at fstab. Now, we've seen this file before in earlier videos. Let's talk about what the information in it means. When the system boots up, the kernel looks for this file in the etc directory. As soon as it figures out that where its uh, root file system is, that 
runs, the kernel, and then the kernel looks for this information at boot time to say, okay, what devices do I need to attach to the system and where should I put them? Well, the first one, of course, is uh, going to be the first partition on that disk and it's SDA1. We're mounting that as root right there. Then home, that's where all of our home directory files live. And then I have added to the system at installation another partition called VM. And then finally, we add a swap file. And a swap space can be one of two things. It can either be a special partition on a hard drive, or it can be just a file that lives in the system. Ubuntu as of, what was it, Ubuntu 16.04? switched over at the war 17 1704 I think it was I might be getting that wrong they switched from creating a special partition on the drive for swap and uh, started creating a file for swap and that needs to be mounted somewhere in the file system as well so this basically goes and looks for a file called swap file and then mounts it up with those rules and that's how the system knows where to put things uh, I might cause a little controversy here, but I am going to mention because I got a comment on this the other day. Somebody said, well, if you have a lot of memory in the system, you don't need to run swap. That is not true. For those of you who have heard that, please don't run your system without at least a little bit of swap. It's not that big a, do big a deal to set aside a little two gigabyte swap file uh, to have the kernel have some scratch space to work with. Swap is virtual memory. If for some reason your system runs out of physical memory, it wants to use swap to keep running. And even if you have 64 gigabytes of memory in your machine, you could have a program with a memory leak and it could use up all that memory and then the system would just freeze and becomes unstable. So it's a good idea to leave a little swap behind and some programs that run on your system actually access swap independently. They use it as well. So you do need to have a little bit. Don't believe the hype. All the people saying you don't need any swap. You need a little bit. Okay. So we've looked at where things get mounted and uh, how that works. So another thing that we want to talk about is where you mount things within the file system if you're doing it yourself. Now we're going to get into actually getting something done with this command and not just looking at it and go, hmm, that's interesting. So if I list all the stuff in the root directory, we've got a couple of interesting uh, directories in here. The first one is CD-ROM, and that is old school. That goes back a long way. There's nothing in there. That is where, if you had to manually mount a CD or a DVD, that's where you could put it so that uh, you could work with it, and you can, do, you can put that in there manually. The other one that you'll notice is that we have... A directory in the file system called MNT it's right there there's nothing in there either that is where the user can mount their own media so let's see how that works let's do it let's let's actually uh, create some media that we can mount into mount and then add files to it does that sound like fun in other words I'm going to demonstrate by doing so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to put a USB drive into the system. I'm just plugging it in right now in the front of the machine. It's a little 8 gigabyte USB stick and it's not empty. It has other stuff on it. So let me go ahead and clear the screen. The system should have found it by now. Let's go ahead and run the LS block. Run it correctly. And what you get here is now you'll see that we have an SDB which is my little USB drive that I have put into the system. It's mounted at media slash Joe slash Linux Mint 18.3 cinnamon 64 bits. So that what, what that tells me is, is that that is a Linux Mint install disk. Well, I'm not running Linux Mint 18.3 anywhere. I don't need this disk anymore. So the first thing that we want to do and what I like to do before I try and format a disk is to blank it. I want to make sure that there's nothing left of the old partition table that can mess me up. So let's go ahead and clear that. The command we're going to use for that is dd. And we are going to put in the input file equals, 
And here's where this comes along. Uh, let's see, dev zero. That's that zero. So what is dev zero? Dev zero is nothing more than a little virtual file <laughs> that spits out zeros constantly. It's a zero generator that runs in the system. When you ask dev zero for data, it just spits out a stream of zeros. There's another one in there called random, and that just puts out total gibberish, but I like to use zero because I just think it's cool. Okay, so we're using a program called DD to do this. DD is a dangerous program. Be very careful. I have a whole video up about DD, and you might want to go check that out. So where are we going to put our output file? We're going to put that on dev sdb. That's our drive. Remember that the system treats everything as a file. So we can make that uh, pretty easy. Uh, we can use that to our advantage in this case. Now, if I try and write to that, since dev slash sdb is in uh, the system part of the system that's owned by the root user, it's not going to let me. So we have to do this as sudo. Before I hit enter on this, there's something that you really need to understand, and that is that DD is extremely powerful. It will erase your hard drive. It will erase your system drive if you get the wrong arguments in it. Be very sure about what you're doing before you use this. So right now, the way I have it set up is if I just turned it loose as DD, then what it would do is it would write zeros until it ran out of space, which is a really good way to blank a drive. If you want to completely blank a drive, that's not a problem. But I don't want to do that. I just really need to wipe out like the first two gigabytes of space on the drive. And that will get rid of all of the partitions and the old journals and everything from the file system, right? So uh, to do that, I'm going to give this a block size. And we're going to call it 1024k so basically uh, the, each block size is going to be one megabyte and then uh, how many of them do we need well I want two gigabytes so the count will equal 2048 2048 so what that's going to do is, is write two gigabytes of nothing but zeros directly to that drive go and away she goes <laughs> And it said it did it really quickly, but I'm telling you right now, it really didn't do it. It's done it to memory, and what's on the drive is actually still there. Now, this is something that you can run into, and in a case like this, I'll show you a command that's very useful, and that is sync. What this does is it tells the system, hey, actually write it to the drive. Take all of the information that you have sitting in memory in the buffers and throw it on the drive. We'll look at buffers later on in this video, by the way. So I'm going to go ahead and sync this. Now it's actually going to write 2 gigabytes of data. This may take a little while, so I'm going to pause the video. That actually took it a little while to do. We've got everything all synced up. So if we run ls block again, looks at the block storage, we now see that SDB has absolutely no partitions on it whatsoever. So we have, in essence, a blank drive. Now it's not really blank. We've just wiped out the first 2 gigabytes on the device, but it's enough for our purposes. No, probably not enough for like the government. You probably have to wipe the whole thing several times. But let's go ahead and now put a partition on there and we are going to format the drive. So we will use fdisk to create partitions and we need to tell fdisk exactly what drive to look at. So we will call it dev sdb and we will run this program. Drive does not contain a recognized partition table. That's exactly what we want to see. Let's go ahead and look for M for help so you guys get some ideas of some of the commands. I actually have done this so many times that I don't even think about it. Uh, what we're really worried about down here is uh, that we create a new partition table. It's right down at the bottom. And if we use G it, with uh, the F disk here, it'll create a GPT partition table. That would be very useful for a very large hard drive if it was like more than four terabytes. But this thing's eight gigabytes. It's very tiny. 
So we're going to use just a good old DOS partition table. That's not a problem. So we just label O, or we just put in O, a small O. Create a new DOS partition table with disk identifier. Well, absolutely, it's done. And now we need to create a new partition in that. So where do we do that? Well, let's see. It's up here. It's in here somewhere. It'll tell me how to do that. Uh, let's see, we delete a partition with D, so we add a new partition with N. So we're going to add a new partition. And we are going to go ahead and do a primary partition. Remember, we're dealing with old DOS, so we have primary and logical. In this case, like I said, it's 8 gigabytes. We need one partition, and it will be primary. It will be partition 1, absolutely. And we are going to use the... Uh, first available sector there that's fine for this it's plug-and-play storage gang it doesn't have to be perfectly aligned like a, a solid-state drive or something like that we're going to use the whole space so yes and now it's Linux and the size is 7.5 gigabytes so we are all done now and what we have to do now is write it so we type in a W. The partition table has been altered. We've created the new partition table, and we're all good to go. And it dumped us back out to a prompt. So now we have, if we go back to LS block again, we've got a new partition on that disk, and it's 7.5 gigabytes, which shows that it's the whole thing. So now what we got to do is put a file system in there. That has to be done as root user, and the command is make fs, and we need to tell it what type of file system we want, and at this point we could use FAT32 or NTFS if we wanted to make this compatible with other devices, but for today's demonstration I want to use the standard Ubuntu default file system which is ext4 ext4 is my favorite Linux native file system even over file systems like butterfs and ZFS and XFS it's just a good all-around system one of these days I'd like to do an in-depth video all about ext4 and really get down into the nuts and bolts of it and show you guys why I like it so much but that's <laughs> I don't know how many people would want to know about that I mean that's geeked them to a high level so now we got to tell it where we want to create our file system. And we want uh, SDB1. I, I always move a little slower, and I know I type slow anyway, but I always move a little slower when doing stuff like this. Because if I would put SDA1, I could wipe out my system, which is always a good idea to use LS block to figure out exactly what you're doing. Okay, So let's go ahead and put ext4 in here. And it is writing out the information right now. This will just take a couple of seconds for this to do. This, of course, because it is a little plug-and-play drive, it's one of those really cheap drives you pick up at, like, the drugstore. Uh, it takes a little while to actually write to. They're, they're very slow. It's done. And so now we have our new file system on the drive. So in order to use it, we're going to have to mount it. So we will mount. We'll do it as root mount, too. And we are going to use the mount command. And we are going to put um, And we want it to mount it at MNT, which is that space that I showed you earlier. It's an empty directory, and that's exactly what this is for. And it should be there. So we will now CD to MNT and list the storage. Oh, 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 see? Did you see the mistake I made? I bet you saw it before I did. Bet you saw it before I did. So we've mounted the root. Uh, drive on SDA into mount. 
<laughs> we need to kind of fix that. <laughs> so let's CD to get out of that. And then we will sudo umount. Like that. Okay. Now let's do that one more time. Let's run that mount command and get it correct. Now I always leave these mistakes into my videos because you know why? You're going to make them too. You're going to do exactly the same thing. And so therefore I leave them in. Now we can change directory to mount. And we have a directory in there called lost and found, which was created by the system uh, when we uh, created the ext4 file system there. And that's it. So let's see if we can actually do something here. Let's create a file. We'll touch a file and call it test. Oh, I don't have permission to do that. Well, I'll tell you why I don't have permission to do that. I created it as the root user. Remember we used sudo? So guess who owns this drive? The root user. So I can't actually write to it, which makes it a little bit on the useless side, doesn't it? We can fix that. It's no big deal. There's two ways to fix that. We could make it where we own the drive, and so nobody else on the system, if it's plugged in, could have access to it. That makes it more secure. Or we could change the permissions on the drive so that it's still owned by root, but then everybody could use it. If it was a drive that I was permanently adding to the system and all of the other users would have access to it, they'd be able to create files, that's probably what I would do. I would let the root owner use it and then, uh, or still own it, and then I would actually uh, make it so that everybody could have access to it. But since this is a drive that only I'm going to use, I'm going to take it in and out of the machine. I don't want anybody else to really use it. I'm going to change the ownership of the drive. So how do we do that? Well, we use the change own command. Now we've talked about changing the mode or the mod, change mod, right? I don't know what that was. sudo change own and then we're going to change it to Joe for the user and Joe for the group. Just separate those by a colon. Remember that's how it looks in LS when you do a long listing? That's why. And then we'll just do slash MNT. It is not going to be MNT the directory that's in the root file system what it's going to be is the drive itself. So even if I remove the drive and put it back in, I'm still going to own it. So let's go ahead and do that. And now what I should be able to do is cd into mnt. And let's see, where's touch test right there? ls. Guess what? Yeah, now I can create the file and I can remove the file test. So I have access to that drive. I have created a new drive. When you're done messing around with anything that you mount on the system, you want to unmount it. But you can't do it if you're actually in the directory that you're mounted to. So if I try right now to do sudo umount dev sdb1, which is another way to do it. Before we did it by doing the directory it was mounted to, it's going to say I can't do it. Let's see, it's busy. It's busy because we're in it. So get out of it. And now we can run that command once again. And it'll do it. We could have also done MNT. So you can unmount the, the drive itself, the device, or you can unmount the target. Either way, as long as you're not currently in that directory, it's not a problem. And of course, it's not mounted. So uh, if I plug this into my system and I'm running a desktop environment, it's automatically going to be mounted. Most desktop environments take USB sticks and they mount them in uh, the media directory or in the run directory in the case of Arch and Manjaro, somewhere on the system and then it pops up on the desktop as an icon or in the file manager and you can click on it and play with it. So that's how that works. Now all of that that I just showed you there are some graphic tools that we can use to do that. So let's take a look at those real quick. Uh, my favorite one to work with for drives on uh, systems is GNOME Disks. So it would be help if I would spell that correctly. 
And I, I can see the comments coming on that misspelling. <laughs> Did you see what he typed? <laughs> anyway, this is a program called Discs. And it uh, either comes with most distributions or you should install it. Because now uh, we can do all of this just from a menu if we wanted to. So if I plug this drive back into the system right here. You see that it pops right up, it found it, and I go in here and it says it's ext4, and then I can unmount it by clicking the little stop there. I've unmounted it, and if I want to reformat the drive, then I just come up here to the menu, and I can format the disk, which creates partition tables, or I can format the drive with ext4 if I want to. Uh, take some time, play around with disks. Another tool that is generally not shipped by default within the distribution, but you will most definitely find in the live environment. So in other words, when you first boot the machine off the live environment, you're going to have this program, and then once you install it, it'll go away, is a program called Gparted. Now, we used Parted. Uh, Parted is a program that creates partition tables and partitions. We didn't use that. We used FDisk and MakeFS. Those are actually uh, even deeper system type programs than parted is um, but gparted which i have installed on this computer is just a graphical representation of parted and there you go and then parted you have to run parted as a root user or it doesn't let you and it's lovely because it gives you graphic representations of all of the drives on your system and then you can create new partition tables, stuff like that. Very useful program. So you can pointy clicky. You don't always have to do it uh, just by commands at a console or a terminal, whatever you want to call it. The thing is about that, though, is that you might be logged into a machine that doesn't have a desktop environment installed. If you're working on a server, if you're using SSH to talk to another machine, it's good to know how to do all this. So do some more research, look around, find out more about Mount uh, because it's a very useful tool to know about in the system and how you can manipulate storage yourself. Final part of this video, we want to take a little time to talk about tools that you can use to figure out what's going on with your system and just kind of look and uh, play around and see what you can learn and also uh, you would probably find a lot of the uh, more advanced tools useful for doing things like killing programs that are misbehaving if something hangs up you might want to jump in and get rid of it and I'm gonna show you how to do that in here as well so the first thing that I want to show you is just a couple of real quick commands that you can use to just check and see what's going on with your computer first thing that you might want to know is how's your memory situation going so you want to learn about the free command now free if you just run it by itself tells you what's going on with your memory but it does it in big numbers that are kind of huh they're just like huh, what is that I think it's I think it's kilobytes or something like that so that kinda is hard to read so what I do is, is I use H on free and that gives you humanly readable output and it tells me that the memory in my machine I've got 31 gigabytes total well there's actually 32 but it rounds down uh, we are using 1.4 gigabytes to run the system 21 gigabytes are free shared memory is 14 megabytes that's uh, taking up a little space and our cache and buffers is 8.2 gigabytes. The cache is stuff that has been read from block storage devices. The system hangs on to that, leaves it in memory, and if it needs it again, then it will run it from the cache instead of actually reading it again from the drive. So if you have a slow spinning hard drive on your machine, like you're on an old laptop with a 5400 RPM, two and a half inch drive the first time you load up your web browser be it Firefox or Google Chrome or whatever it takes forever to load you ever notice that that's because it has to read all that stuff off that drive but the you close the browser and you come back to it later and you open it again and guess what now 
your web browser just opens right up like a shot. The reason why is because it's reading it out of memory. As long as there's enough memory on the computer to contain what's in the cache, uh, it will be read from the cache and not from the drive. The cache memory doesn't take away from available system memory because if you need more memory, stuff that's old in the cache gets dumped and then it's reused. The memory management of the system is trying to figure out how to do the best with what you have. Also, the uh, free command shows you your swap space and whether it's being used. On this machine, we've got 32 gigabytes of RAM installed. It's not going to be swapping <laughs> a whole lot. But like I said, you do need a little bit of swap space uh, for the kernel just in case it needs it. So we're safe here. This machine's going to be really stable as it runs. So the free command is very useful. The next one that I want to show you is disk free, DF. And once again, we're going to use that H to make it humanly readable on this command. So if I, um, no, I typed in DFD instead of, there you go. Now it shows us all of the block storage that's attached to the system and how much space is available in that block storage. And it even goes so far as to show us things like snap packages and virtual file systems that are used by the kernel, like tempfs there, and you see how that works. So this is actually very useful if you're wondering if your drives are getting full and you want to see what's going on. And then finally, the last one that I'm going to show you is kind of a silly one, but it's really useful. It's called uptime. And what uptime will tell you is how long the computer's been up. It tells you how many people are logged in, and it shows you a load average on the computer. So the load average basically works out. you got three numbers, and it'll be 0 point or 1 point something. And so the first one is the last minute, the second one's the last five minutes, and the third one would be the last 15 minutes. So this machine has pretty much been doing uh, what it's been doing pretty steadily for the entire time that I have been doing this video. We haven't been loading it down because really the only thing that it's doing is recording video, and that's what's giving it a load at all. Now, if you run this and you see that your system is giving you really high load averages, like around five or six or something like that, your system is working really hard and you might want to go figure out exactly why. So those three little things, they're very useful. And what I did was, is I wrote a script that would let me run all of that at once. And I want to show you how I put that together. So it's in bin and the name of the script is check sys. Now I wrote this actually for a server because I do have a server for easy Linux that I log into and maintain and I want to know how the system's doing as soon as I log in I want to know what's up so I can run this script right here and it will run these three commands so the first one is uh, s uh, the the free command which we looked at the second one is the df command to find out what's going on with the drives and all of this gobbledygook on the end right here basically filters out that output on the screen and it just gives me devices that's all it does and it's all of this right here that's what that does and then finally uptime when I created this script one of the things I made sure is that I put the exact path name uh, the path for each application that I was going to run I did that on purpose because I want it to be very fast I don't want it have to, I don't want it to have to go check the path because that actually slows things down a little bit so uh, I'm going to leave this up on the screen while I'm talking. You can pause it and you can copy this down. This is one that I cannot share in the YouTube description simply because of the fact that it is um, got a lot of brackets in there and YouTube doesn't let you post brackets. But if this is something that you want to actually try for yourself, there it is. So when I run that, It clears my screen and it gives me all of that information in one fell swoop. This is an example of useful system monitoring right here. <laughs> and there are so many other commands that you can use to get information. I'm just going to show you a couple. I mean, just a couple. There, there are tons of these and pretty much any information that you want to figure out, you could probably go online and search for how to find out at a command line, blah, and it will show up. They'll give you a command that'll do it. 
One command that we've already looked at is ls block. That shows us all of the devices that are hooked to the system. But we can also use ls pci, uh, all of the storage devices hooked to the system. But we can also use ls pci to show us all of the devices on the PCI bus. So this spits out a bunch of great information here. Here's another one that we can use. This is LS CPU. That just tells us about the CPU. In this machine, we've got two CPUs, four cores each. So it's twin Xeon CPUs. And it tells you all the information about the CPU in your system. Uh, here's another one that's kind of useful uh, you'll run into when you're trying to get the IDs off of all of these devices. You'll notice that in the uh, FS tab file, it wants to use universal um, IDs, device IDs to mount the drives. Well, you have to figure out what those are. So let's, let's get a list of those. So you have to do this as the root user. We'll do BLK ID. And now we have the block IDs for all of the uh, partitions on this machine right now. We even have the uh, UUID. Uh, I'm confusing you now. Yeah, oh no, it's block ID, UUID. That's exactly what we're doing. We have the UUIDs for uh, the partitions that are mounted to the system. And that's how that works. Very useful command. So there's more. I mean, we could go through a ton more of commands like this that give you raw information. But it really becomes useful when you start using tools that bring all of this stuff together. So an old tool that's been around on Linux for a really long time that brings all this stuff together that I've just showed you is top. The top command not only shows us uh, stuff that's going on with the system and how the memory is being used. It also shows us the processes that are running on the system. These are programs or services that are running. It shows you who owns those programs, how much CPU they're taking up, and very importantly, it gives you uh, a PID, which is a process identification number. You can get the process IDs for what you're running in your own environment with a very simple command, and I'll show you that one right now. So let's uh, just run um, PS, and you'll notice that it only shows us a couple of things because we're not running much. But if I should do this, if I should do gedit, right, and then I, uh, whoop, my keyboard went a little nuts there for a second. So we put the ampersand on the end, put that in the background, and we opened up gedit, and I'm going to go back to my terminal. That's going to be running in the background, and let's open up something else. Um, well, I don't know. We'll open up uh, GNOME disks. We looked at that earlier, right? Let that open up, and we will go to the terminal, leave that in the background. Oh, I forgot to put the ampersand. Hang on, folks. Let's do that one more time. Put on the ampersand. There you go. And now, if I run that same program, that PS program, PS command, it shows us that, uh, oh, B. <laughs> Oh, there's a Freudian slip for you. I said PS, my mind thought BS, and then my hands typed it. That's a good one. So there you go. Now you see that we have other stuff running in the background. So that's running services uh, or and uh, programs that we have started ourselves. And we can get rid of those programs by killing them and using the numbers there that uh, have the PIDs. We can also kill them pretty easy by just doing kill all. So if I want to get rid of gedit and then run ps again, you'll see that is now gone. So you might be familiar with doing something like this. Kill 9, which tells it to hang up, and, you, and then you type in the uh, PID number there and it gets rid of it, right? 
We're not going to do that. We don't need to. We can just do kill all. A lot of programs these days, they open up more than one process while they're running. And so therefore, we can just use kill all to get rid of them if we know we're running them. We can use PSA to see all of the processes that are running on the computer, whether we have access to them or not. That outputs a lot of information. We can use top. We already looked at that. Now what I like to use at a command line, this is a program that I always install. It doesn't necessarily come automatically with your Linux system, but it's one that I use a lot. It's called HTOP. And it's in the uh, repositories for just about every distribution somewhere. So like on Ubuntu or Debian, just put in sudo apt install HTOP and you'll get it. And this really puts everything together. Up top, it shows us what our CPUs are doing. Uh, they're capturing video right now, which is why they're working so hard. And then we get all kinds of information. We get our load average right there. We get the uptime. This machine's been up for three days. How many tasks are we running? 141. Uh, two are running right now. Uh, it shows us what's going on with the memory. The same deal doesn't show us the buffers and all that stuff. Shows us what's going on with swap there. And one of the beautiful things about this program is that it responds to your mouse. So if I want to filter that out and I just want to look with anything with simple in it, look, there's all the threads that are open right now with simple screen recorder. And then if I want to kill a process, I can do that with a mouse click or by using the uh, function keys. HTOP is a program definitely worth getting and playing with. It's extremely useful. I've got it running on every Linux machine that I have. I do have a video on the channel where I go through everything about HTOP, so you can look at that as well. And finally, before we wrap things up, we're talking about system monitoring and processes. We just really touched on all that stuff there are books written on that subject so you can go out and find out more but of course if you're running a desktop then you probably will use a graphic uh, system monitor and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that most desktops come with a system monitor we're using gnome so we get the excellent gnome system monitor and it shows us all the same information. Uh, it shows us what processes are running on the system. And then you can go through here and just click on things and then you can kill them. You can do whatever you want with them. Uh, this shows the CPU usage, memory. And then finally you can see how your drives are doing as well. So there you go, gang. We've covered a lot of ground in this video. Thank you for hanging out with me. Hey, this is the longest one in the series so far, but I wanted to get that out of the way because I don't know when the next time I'm going to get back to this series is going to be. So if you watch video one, two, and three, just break them up, take some time, watch them, learn them. You're going to have a whole lot of information under your belt. Suggestions, feedback, always welcome. And you can also join the discussion at Easy Talk. You can check out Easy Linux on Facebook if you're a Facebook user. And if you do, like the channel, please, on Facebook. It certainly does help. And, of course, there's EasyLinux.com where all of this stuff comes together. Thanks again for watching. This was a really fun video to do. I hope you got something out of it. We'll talk again soon.